Articles of Faith is a weekly interview show featuring scholars and writers who have written about the doctrines and teachings of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Articles of Faith is a production of Fair Mormon and is hosted by Nick Galetti. Hello, this episode's guest is Royal Skousen. Royal Skousen is a professor of linguistics and English at Brigham Young University. He is considered to be a leading expert on the textual history of the Book of Mormon. He is also the author of the article in The Interpreter, another account of Mary Whitmer's viewing of the gold plates. Welcome, Royal Skousen. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. So I have to say right off the bat that I, I love your name, Royal. Ah. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm curious, what's, what's the history of that name? How did that name come to be? Do you know? Oh, I'm named after my grandfather. Most royals these days are named after someone with that name. And uh, my, uh, my grandfather really welcomed my mother when she married my father, joined the church, and uh, she just loved him. So she gave me his name, and Excellent. I've carried it. Uh, Family likes to change the name to Roy. He was actually oh, called Roy, okay. but but I I've maintained Royal. So was there ever a period in your life though that you were thinking maybe Roy's not a bad idea or you no just, no I always it? I always maintained yeah, Royal a- because my father was Roy Leroy and my grandfather was Roy and I just. <laughs> No, it's have beautiful. Have to be a little different. <laughs> I, well, it's a, it's a beautiful name because, and, and in many ways, there's that theme of royalty throughout the scriptural texts. Ah, uh, uh, yes, and, I have to live up to that. <laughs> that's, that's a good standard. Uh, so you're you're a linguist, I right. guess, uh, in one manner yes. of speaking, amongst other specialties, and you served a mission in Finland. That's right. Uh, I had a book report in the third grade on Finland, and I still haven't forgotten it. Ah. Uh, it's kind of funny how those things stick with you. But what was your first venture? Was that your first venture into other languages? Uh, no, actually, I learned Latin first in high school. My uh, mother had taken Latin and taught me wow. a few of the declensions, just used to repeat them. I thought, well, I'll take Latin. So I did for two years, then I took German and... Uh, I had um, about four years of German and was sent on a mission then to Finland. So, wow, were you thinking you were going to go to Germany then? I mean, based on no, I didn't. I didn't know really what uh, what I would get. I think there were, at that time they sent a lot of Russian speaking elders to Finland with the thinking they might open up Russia from Finland, which in fact did happen, but many decades later. And the other was that uh, Latin had all these declensions and uh, conjugations and Finnish is even worse. (laughs) And so I think there was this thinking that if you can learn some Latin, you might be able to learn Finnish. There you Um, go. So uh, there there was always a number of us that knew the classical languages in Finland. How often do you revert back to mission experiences? I know there's some people that always quote them in church and things like that, but are you one to kind of reflect back on that time in your life? Well, it's the determining fact, it, determining events of my life. My uh, uh, Finnish language is so different from the other languages of Europe. It's not Indo-European, so... Um, that led me into linguistics, but my wife is Finnish, and so I have this huge cultural background in Finnish. And uh, kind of never leaves you then. Yeah, I write my diary <laughs> in Finnish and things like that. Really? So even to this day, that's so fascinating. It's it's a part. It's a real part of my life. That's for sure. Did you guys try and pass it on to your children? Well, we tried. Uh, it only worked <laughs> when we visited Finland. I was there on a Fulbright, okay. and two of my girls learned Finnish quite well at the time. But the the rule really is it's the language of the area you live in that takes over no matter sure. what. So it was hard to maintain it uh, once we came back. After sure. That. You talk about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and it has to be an intriguing prospect for study as a linguist simply understanding the translation process and things like that, I would, I would right. assume. I guess this is kind of evidenced in your life with your efforts with the Book of Mormon Critical Text Project. Now, I, as I understand it, 
you it took over 25 years it's been or is it still going it's still going on okay. i'm in the last part of it i'm working on the history of the text but i've i've done the transcripts of the two manuscripts i've done six books on the text itself trying to determine that and then i published the the Yale edition of the Book of Mormon called The Earliest Text, that was about five years ago. I've done sort of the core portion, but now I'm working on the history of the text and the nature of the original text. So I'm hoping to finish that up in the next couple of years. And Did you have a timeline? Did you say this was going to oh, be a 30-year uh, project? I hate or? to say what that is. <laughs> uh, I was I was looking at... After I'd worked a couple years on it, I, I said it should be done in about three years. Oh. <laughs> and I've been saying that actually ever since. Now I'm down to two, so uh, two years. So I think it's, I think it's doable, you know. But, but you keep discovering things that you weren't expecting to find. Such as? Well, I think one of the big findings for me is that the language of the Book of Mormon is not dating from the 1800s. It is not upstate New York English, and a lot of people have, are very surprised at this. And um, But the, the, f the major work I've done thus far is on the vocabulary and the meaning of the words and they're actually dating from about the 1540s up to 1740. Hmm. The text is actually quite archaic, and much of it um, has been obscured. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, editors don't believe it's right. The, the text will say, counsel your brothers, and it means counsel with your brothers. That usage died out about 1600, but it's in the original text of the Book of Mormon, two places. The 1920 edition, the preposition with was added. Whether uh, probably Brother Talmadge was responsible for it, and whether he knew that it meant that or whether he thought maybe it was a mistake and that the word with had been dropped out, but he put it in. And in a sense, rightfully so, because people need to understand the text. But in actual fact, um, in the late, in the 1500s, it would have been perfectly understood the way it was. But this is fairly surprising and... Um, there's another one the talking about the Red Sea departing when it meant it was parted. Right. And um, this is a usage depart, meaning to part. They, they departed my raiment is the way the scripture reads up to the King James Bible. Then it was changed to they parted my raiment. The Book of Mormon had departed for the Red Sea, and uh, the 1830 printer, I think, just thought, oh, this, is, this can't be right, so it's changed, it's changed it. departed. And you get these kinds. Uh, some of them are still in there to say that a person is extinct when they die. Is about There's about four or five of them in the current text, and we can sort of figure out that it what it means that they die, but it doesn't mean that one's progeny species will no longer exist in the way we use it today. Sure. But we can figure those out so they haven't been changed. Uh, but I've been even studying the bad grammar in them days. Everyone laughs and says, <laughs> oh, that's got to be Joseph Smith's upstate New York English. But I found it in academic writing in the 1600s. I mean – scholarly academic writing will have in hmm. in them days. And so I'm I'm just backing away from the idea of saying the the Book of Mormon is this full of this hick language. It's uh, this is a very surprising result. Um, uh, many people want me to explain it and I'm not going to explain it. I don't, just I don't have an explanation. I I think we should study it. And uh, being a linguist, 
has, has been good because I don't have this prejudice automatically to say, well, this is bad grammar or this is just sure to be rejected and thrown out, uh, you know, uh, automatically. So um, I think linguists have a more even view and don't go crazy if if they if they see something like they was yet wroth and <laughs> and yeah. uh, and that's in printed printed texts um, quite prevalently up to about 1700 and then it starts dropping off and be, you know is recognized as non-standard but so that's that's a very surprising result, yeah, I think. Absolutely. And, um, so I'm still studying that, and there'll be a whole section in Volume Three that I'm working on on the original language of the text and um, and its editing and how it's been changed. So what what was kind of the initial motivation behind doing this project, and has it changed over the years? Well, the original motivation was to make transcripts. Of the two manuscripts, the original, which is the dictated one, and the copy that they made called the printer's manuscript to take for the 1830 printer to set the type from. And my that was my only motivation. I, I wasn't trying to set out to find errors. In fact, I didn't, I didn't think there would be any that I would find. And uh, the hundreds. church didn't think I would find any. <laughs> So I was allowed access to photographs because they had done work and for the 1981 edition and everyone thought that it had all been found. And it turned out those photographs were, first of all, very hard to read. and uh, But nonetheless, they were showing things that had been missed. And uh, so that was the first thing I discovered was that there were mistakes, accidental ones, not ones that really, really drastically changed the text. But um, nonetheless, I was finding them. And and so that was the beginning. And uh, But my original intent was just to make the transcripts. So in 2001, the transcripts were published. And now I'm one of the editors for three books that will be published by the Joseph Smith Papers, not only giving the transcripts of the manuscripts, but the photographs themselves. Mm. So people will now be able to actually see the photographs. And that that's a very important step forward, I think. It's that, an incredible level of transparency. Yeah, the, the, I, I think originally, you know, people are a little worried what's in these and people are worried too about the bad grammar and the church. Joseph Smith was ridiculed from the beginning for the bad grammar and um, and even that's one important thing for volume three is to establish this bad grammar is archaic grammar more than it's bad grammar. So, okay. And... That's kind of a, a cherry on top kind of experience, right? It wasn't what you were trying to find, but you found well, it. Well, I wasn't actually trying to find anything, just do the transcript sure. work. And so the first thing was to find the changes that had been missed. And then I realized that since we only have 28% of the original manuscript, we weren't going to find everything, everything and without the text being re-revealed, and that isn't my job, and, uh, <laughs> you know, that that properly belongs to the brethren, and so it's a scholarly work, but I was discovering all this other information about the nature of the text, how accurately it had been given to Joseph Smith, that it was a very precise text. It wasn't one that he was just getting an idea in his mind and struggling to put it into his own language. It, he was given an actual text of English, I believe. And, and that's a pretty surprising result in and of itself. Uh, witnesses of the translation believe that, but scholars, even in the church, have believed that Joseph Smith got ideas and put it into his own language. Sure. And, uh and I think that's one of the biggest findings of the project is that, no, Joseph Smith got a revealed text of English, in English. And um, that's what I think 
the evidence all supports. And in volume three, I'm going to go through all that evidence Excellent. for that. When is that going to be coming out? Do you know? Well, uh, it's going to be in four books. I believe it'll be four books and uh, volume three. Um, and it sh- should start appearing in a couple years. We've, I've already... Oh, okay. So it's not like around the corner. Well, I've done the typesetting for about 1,500 pages. <laughs> Wow. I mean, my, my typesetter has done it, and I've written it and had it edited and all that. And um, so there's a whole section on the the grammatical editing of the text, and that's about 1,000 pages. Jeez. And then there's 400 pages on just the spellings and how the scribal spellings and what they tell us about their pronunciations and various things, and Joseph Smith's pronunciations, plus uh, the spellings of the editors, how they've changed, how we've had British spellings, so to speak, intermixed, and how they've gone to more standard American spellings. So all of that's been done. Okay. So right now I'm working on the vocabulary and the style of the language and the grammar style that was in the original text. And I'm I'm kind of curious now that you bring this up. Uh, when we pe- we we have these people say that there this was bad grammar, this was backwoods grammar or whatever you want to call yeah. it. Here we have Oliver Cowdery acting as scribe, who was a school teacher and presumably had a. a better grasp of good grammar than Joseph did. Do we have any experiences where he said, Joseph, that that's not good grammar? <laughs> uh, well, actually, the evidence in the manuscripts is that they are faithfully trying to reproduce what Joseph Smith was apparently seeing in the instrument he was using. And there are some occasions where they first accidentally wrote the good grammar, and they correct it to the bad grammar. Did Joseph correct them? Uh, Well, we don't know. You you know, the evidence suggests that it's not Oliver, but he's following the dictation of whatever is in front of them because there are examples of of the opposite as well. So it's not – it, it's one that I I will go over in some detail in Volume Three as to is there error are there errors in the text that show sort of overlay? For instance, um, one of the scribes, probably one of the Whitmers, wrote "drowned," but Oliver always wrote "drowned," and the other scribe, his brother, wrote "drowned," if I recall. So none of them, only once, there's "drowned." Okay. And that may be just that scribe's pronunciation. So we we there are the is this possibility of what I call grammatical overlay by the scribes, even Joseph Smith. We just have to look at it. However, we can find drowned in fifteen sixteen hundreds. We can find attacked. Attacked the the word attacked always has a t on it in the manuscripts, and we can find that as well. It's really quite old. Mm. So whether that's overlay or not is something we have to probably just look into. But I've I've been taking the position that if if we can find that it is old, we'll put it in and not worry about removing it. So So it's got a it's got a basis, so you can justify But Oliver Oliver is not he, even though he teaches school, he 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 is not as educated as we might think a school teacher would be. Okay. So he misunderstands things. So he will write down, they arrested the scriptures. Twice he writes, arrested, okay. instead of rested. He doesn't, arrested, you know, to twist the scriptures is already archaic. And so he doesn't recognize it. He thinks it's arrested, the scriptures. That's what he wrote. And even the 1830 typesetter put arrested, the scriptures. (laughs) So even he didn't recognize it. So sometimes we we think, you know, that they're going to know all the things we would know. So he thinks, Oliver thinks there's a fraction in the government instead of a faction. Oh, okay. And, you know, I I remember learning that 
reading the Federalist Papers in high school, you know, and <laughs> yeah. Madison talking about factions. That was a new word for me. And, it, and at that time for Oliver, he, he didn't recognize it. So, you know, Oliver by the eight, middle of the 1830s when he becomes a lawyer and so forth is much better at – he learns. And when he's acting as scribe, there are errors in it. And uh, we just have to recognize that uh, both Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Smith are on a learning curve and they're – as we would be, probably. Sure, absolutely. You know? That's totally understandable. Well, you ha- let's move on now to your, your article because you okay. mentioned uh, a little bit that you are working now on the history side of the book, this Book of Mormon project. Right. Um, I would assume that your article on another account of Mary Whitmer's viewing of the gold plates stems from that effort. Uh, no, it's no? just um, the family. See, this, this is a tradition. This is a third account. And they all, all three accounts come from the Whitmer family, all three from different sons. So we have David Whitmer's account and then John Whitmer that doesn't come from John himself but from his son, John Jr. And uh, But they're quite similar. And maybe there was cross-fertilization between their accounts. They are so similar. It. Yeah. Uh, but then there is this account coming through the Christian Whitmer. Christian was the oldest, and he dies in 1835 in Missouri. And his widow then marries um, a Hewlett, a Sylvester Hewlett, and their family comes west. They come with the saints. So they kept this account too. And they just told it amongst themselves until one of the uh, one of the descendants, remembering the grandmother telling it over and over, recorded it finally in the 1950s. And so, uh, and then the grandson of this person sent me the write up that uh, that his grandfather had done. Um, just because he's, I mean, how did that Well, come because he knows I'm doing this project. Okay. So people know that I'm doing this, so they send it to me. And, um, and it, it's an astounding account because it finally gives a motivation for the angel Moroni showing the plates to Mary Whitmer. You see, the other two accounts simply have, you're working really hard and I feel sorry for you here. It's, a, it's an assumption you know, as to why, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they sort of assume that she's working so hard she needs some encouragement. A reward. Yeah, almost a reward. And you sit there and, you, you know, and I used to always think about that. Well, what about, what about Emma? Emma never got to see the plates. <laughs> She got to feel yeah. them, right? Yes, yeah, she did. She probably wasn't even supposed to do that, <laughs> but she did. Samuel did it too. Samuel Smith apparently felt the plates through the the cloth. And so, but you know, you you if you're if you look at that assumption of those other two accounts, you might think, well, why wasn't Moroni going around showing it to a lot of people, you know, to give them encouragement? But he wasn't. And this one makes it quite clear that she was peeved because Joseph Smith and Oliver because they would work hard on the translation, but when they had a moment to take a break, they wouldn't just help with chores and things around. They would go out to a pond and skip rocks. And she thought, you know, those guys could be helping me instead of skipping, (laughs) you know, and I can just see a mother thinking that about kids. You know, and uh, she's probably viewing them sort of as kids, you know. And uh, so she was about ready to turn them out, which in and of itself indicates a f- she was an important person in this household. Well, and, and her frustration had grown pretty severe. Yeah, but I mean that, you know, Peter Whitmer Sr. is going to follow her <laughs> desire <laughs> yeah. to remove these guys. And this was more serious because they needed a place uh, where there would be a lot of males around to sort of be act as a protective source for doing the translation in privacy and so forth. 
And so in this account, he, um, Moroni says, I got permission from the Lord to show them to you, which is interesting too, that he consulted with the Lord, that he wasn't just doing these things on his own. Sure. And, um, and of course, from that moment, then of course, she was fully supportive and, and was, had no problem with uh, doing all this extra work. Uh, it is interesting that we can confirm that Joseph Smith liked to skip rocks. And I put that in there <laughs> yes. because when he worked with Martin Harris on the 116 pages the year earlier, when they would take a break, they would go out to the Susquehanna River and skip rocks. And Martin refers to that. So it's nice to get this sort of confirmation of these things that they that Joseph liked to skip rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of fun. There's very little academic value in it otherwise, right? It's just kind of a fun thing. Well, you know, you've got you've got this account, which is quite old. Now, the other two accounts are from the 1880s, David Whitmer okay. and John Whitmer Jr. So they're much closer, even though then they're still, you know, 50 years sure. away from the actual occurrence. This one is going to be, you know, over a hundred years, much, uh, you know, much more. And uh, so it is good to have these confirming accounts so that you don't say, well, it's been really mutilated over the years sure. and how can you trust these things? And um, I think, one, it does give a motivation for Moroni showing her the plates, and it is confirmed by this incident of skipping the rocks as something Joseph liked to do. So Yeah, a little historical piece that connects it. Yeah. Okay. Well, at this point, how have you been able to kind of authenticate this as a real thing, or does it not need to be because it's just been passed down? Well, uh, in in the... Uh, what I put in the Mormon interpreter are all the emails and, and the accounts from Carl Cox. So I try to establish his provenance and from his grandfather. And he sent me the actual uh, document, which the grandfather, which they published. So I have a copy okay. of photographic, and that should probably be reproduced at some time. So, I mean, that's the earliest we have of this uh, from the 1950s, but we have an actual, you know, that's, that's what we have. And so I wanted in the article not to embellish it with my, there's really very little of me except for some of the interpretation of these things I've mentioned, but mm -hmm. I've tried to reproduce. I didn't reproduce in the... Mormon interpreter the actual document because they don't really have a good means for doing this right now. But um, eventually this... we'll probably put it put it in volume three. Um, okay, so it'll so, be reprinted in there. Yeah, the actual what the what Carl Cox printed for his grandfather in the 1950s. He had to do some hunting to find this <laughs> document uh, for me. Did but, he knew it existed? Yeah, he knew. Okay. He had done it, but when he was a young man in his, I guess, 20s, but he didn't know where it was, so he did some hunting for me. Wow. Because I, I, I said, well, we ought to have that, you know, as best, furthest back we can find something to sure. establish it. Is... So, what what is the significance of are are there any other significances to Mary Whitmer being another witness because there's still a lot of members of the church that are unaware that there was even another witness other than the ones we have recorded at the beginning of the book of mormon let alone yeah. a woman witness well hers is different also in that as far as we know she just orally told it to family members over and over but she, she's telling it so the others quite clearly have a both the three witnesses and the eight witnesses have an actual document each one they're quite different these documents the three witness document is a miraculous statement of an angel appearing 
uh, the voice of the Lord, a table in front of them with objects. They all, the, the two of them describe these objects. They were not allowed to touch anything, not the plates, not the, the, uh, the apparently the uh, Nephite interpreters were there, what we call the Urim and Thummim, uh, the sword of Laban, the brass plates. All these things were apparently on this table and the angel Moroni picks up the plates and shows them, leaves through them, but they never get to hold them. And bo- both David and Martin said it was visionary. Mm. They, so it's very different. The, three, the eight witnesses go out into the woods and Joseph comes walking into the little clearing with hefting, holding the plates. They heft them. They look at them. Right. This is very physical. And the statement is very physical. It's, it's a legal statement, the said Smith. You know, you read it. <laughs> yeah. it says, but the three witness one is a very spiritual and it uses the language of the Book of Mormon. Whereas the eight witness one does not use the language. It uses the verb to heft, which isn't even in the Book of Mormon. It uses language which is very 1800. It's sort of interesting how they, one is a very physical account, one is a very spiritual. And it's interesting in a court of law how both of these would be, play. Yeah. Would, would really hold up well. And I, th- I think sometimes we as Latter-day Saints don't realize what Joseph Smith's trying to do here is provide legal as- evidence for what he has done. When he, when he got done, he went in and told his mother the relief was so much because now other people knew. And sometimes we in the church don't appreciate Joseph Smith's desire to have other witnesses when he had his first vision, he never had another witness of it. So that minister, right from the beginning, said he was deluded. And right. he, you know, and how could he prove it? He couldn't. Right. He couldn't. He had no. But everything else Joseph ever does, from getting the priesthood with Oliver, he's got Oliver there. Right. When he sees the Savior, he's got Oliver. And when Sydney the, Rigdon it went, and Sydney Rigdon with the th- vision of the three degrees of glory. Mm-hmm. You know, it's amazing how Joseph Smith has other witnesses. It's important. And so we have the three and the eight. And um, this is the, the Mary Whitmer is not of the same nature. It is to encourage her to not turn them out. This would have caused a major problem. They would have... It, it was difficult to go back to Susquehanna because there were difficulties in the neighborhood doing the translation. Where were they going to go right. to do it? So it was, a, it was a serious issue. So I don't think we should look at hers as the 12th witness in the sense of the, the three and the eight. Right. Because theirs is a legal, one miraculous and one very physical, but legal – witnessing testimony whereas hers is a personal one well she was under no obligation to share that witness correct that's right and she only as far as we can tell only told it to her own children so she almost had to kind of keep that secret in a way well you notice in the account in the mormon interpreter the third family the uh the woman who is telling the the story for a while wasn't telling it because it wasn't out there. And then when Joseph F. Smith and others were telling their interviews with John C. Whitmer and David Whitmer and were publishing these, then she felt like she could start telling it again. So there is sometimes a reluctance, you know, these are personal things and we shouldn't be maybe sharing them. So she felt like then she could. So it, I know people like to call her the twelfth witness and and make a big thing out of it, but it isn't legally establishing like those eleven witnesses are, and theirs well, it's is hearsay all in a, in a, in one in a way it is all of them because we don't even we don't have anything from her directly, not even right. handwritten or anything, but they all 
even though they differ in some of the details, they're all supporting of what took place. And we now have a very good reason for understanding why Moroni was concerned and needed to show the plates to this very important person. <laughs> it, it, it seems like peop, it seems like women with the name Mary get some pretty incredible experiences. <laughs> there you go. Maybe so. <laughs> Maybe it's the name. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess in in the end, you you see this experience and you think this is something I've got to print. Yeah. Uh, because it's got it's got historical value and and helps. I guess, the, is it is it a kind of an apologetic source then, just because it simply is another witness? No, I don't view... See, I, I'm saying this, this 12th witness really doesn't... isn't of the same level, right. obviously. And the provenance issue with all three accounts is, is not the same. I mean, these others are signing their names to right. this document. They're going to print them in the book, and they're going to be called upon. And so it's a very public kind of witnessing. So I don't I don't view it that way. I felt like it was great to have an account which gave another aspect that gave a perhaps real reason for why it had to be done. And it's a very uh, practical reason. Yeah. And yes, it's much more practical and necessary and it isn't just like here we're just showing the plates to people to make them feel good about this. I, I I thought it was important to do it. Uh, I had told a few people about it. You know, I'd gotten this from Carl Cox, and uh, and I was just going to put it in volume three, and then I realized, well, I've been telling people, and it's sort of spreading around. I better, better publish it, it yeah. because it'll come out in some garbled view. And uh, so I was pretty careful in just trying to give what Carl Cox had sent me and not try to add too much of myself to it in that account. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I, I, I appreciate it. I enjoyed the article, and I, I know that you have several other articles uh, that you've done for the interpreter, so I want to encourage people to go back through those old issues and find those. Uh, again, Royal Skousen is a BYU professor and linguist and a scholar of the Book of Mormon. His article, Another Account of Mary Whitmer's Viewing of the Gold Plates, can be found in The Interpreter at mormoninterpreter.com. Thank you very much, Royal, for coming in. Glad to have been here. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode of Articles of Faith with your host, Nick Galletti. This has been a production of Fair Mormon. This and other podcasts are available at fairmormon.org. The opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of Fair Mormon or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Please subscribe to our show in iTunes. Questions or comments can be sent to podcast at fairmormon.org. Tune in each Monday for another episode of Articles of Faith. Thank you for listening.